My dear friends, good day. Do you ever wake up at night and have no idea what time it is? You feel rested, but not too rested. And above all, there's no way of knowing whether it's 3 a.m. or 7 a.m. If there's a way, it's by alarm clock, cell phone, or watch. Not an easy invention, and one that took a long time to appear in our history, but a life changer. For example, I'd never have been able to work on Nota Bene without controlling my time. The watch didn't have just one inventor. In fact, it's the result of technological advances that have marked the entire history of watchmaking. So let's take a look at the history of watches going back to antiquity. Even before the 15th century BCE, there were two ways of measuring the passage of time. The first is the gnomon, a simple stick planted in the ground. The shadow it casts on the ground evolves according to the course of the sun. And thanks to this, you can find your bearings both in time and in space, since its shadow moves from west to east. The second is the clepsydra, a kind of water hourglass. Like the hourglass, it's very efficient for measuring a limited amount of time. On the other hand, the oldest clepsydra were very unreliable over the long term and only served to give an estimate of time. This all changed around 1450 BCE in Egypt. The sundial was invented, a flat surface on which a circle was drawn. Its 360 degrees cut into 15 degree sections, enabling the gnomon to divide the day into 24 one-hour segments. It's the first time that the solar cycle has made it possible to accurately measure the passage of time. It was a real revolution, enabling society of the time to condition its daily life. Work schedules, rest times, prayers, public announcements. This sundial reached the West around the 9th century BCE, and it was not about to disappear, since for centuries and centuries, throughout antiquity and the Middle Ages, it was the only instrument to measure the hours of the day. Still, it would be handy to be able to keep accurate time without the sun, even at night or on overcast days. So some craftsmen are trying to create a mechanism that measures the same slices of time. And for that, we don't care about the visual aspect. The aim is not to have a dial like the sundial. So, no circle, no gnomon, and even fewer hands. Huge weight machines are designed with cogs and regulators. Driven by the continuous movement of the weights, the mechanisms, which operate gear wheels, drive pinions that strike a bell at regular intervals. A nice little detail. Each hour has its own number of strokes. One for one hour, two for two hours, and so on. The first machine of this type was built in Milan in 1335. This is a very cumbersome and expensive clock, used by the whole community. The practice spread throughout Italy before conquering all of Europe around 1400. But it's a shame to have completely discarded the very visual aspect of the sundial, whose shadow also made it possible to find one's way between the hours. So at the beginning of the 15th century, some public clocks were equipped with the first dials, divided into 12 hours. But here we have two opposing extremes. On the one hand, the stroke of the hands is a very delicate thing. On the other hand, the weight drop is quite a gruff thing. It lacks precision, with a gradual shift in the hours of the day. And because of this, from one city to another, public time isn't always the same. And that was even before jet lag was discovered. The solution is to miniaturize the gears more and more, which is quite difficult. We're dealing with parts that are more and more delicate, and little by little, craftsmen become specialists that we call watchmakers. This was the golden age of watchmaking. In 1480, the first table or pocket clocks were created. Then, in the 16th century, with no single inventor attested, Peter Henlein is often cited as one of the first watch designers. It was in Nuremberg that he fashioned the first clock, a finely crafted oval-shaped jewel. It's known as the Nuremberg Egg. Of course, there was no longer any question of dropping a weight, as the watch ran on a spring that had to be wound regularly to maintain its precision. And now, at last, with the portable watch, L'Heure enters the world of fashion. It could be worn as a necklace or hung from a purse. Italy, Germany, and France produced these miniature mechanical clocks, known as watch boxes. They were worn around the neck or pinned to ladies' and gentlemen's blouses. But advances in watchmaking soon made it possible to flatten them. The cases became the famous gusset watches. Why gusset? Because it fits into the gusset, which is the pocket of a man's suit. Rather practical. For safety's sake, it is still customary to attach it to the garment's bodice with a chain, but it remains hidden in the suit pocket. In those days, pulling out a watch was a classy gesture that showed everyone that you'd made it in life. Not surprising given the materials and techniques used cost a lot. From 1556 onwards, it was Switzerland's turn to set the pace for the rest of Europe. And that's because of the wars of religion. 
Firstly, Geneva was totally Calvinist at the time and forbade any ostentatious signs of wealth, that is, jewelry. The city's goldsmiths were caught off guard, but they had an idea how to get around the ban. After all, watches are pretty, but they're tools, not jewelry. And right at the same time when many Protestants were being hunted down in Europe and came to Switzerland for refuge. Between 1600 and 1800, Geneva tripled its population. Among the newcomers were many English watchmakers renowned for their innovations. This was a period of sustained economic development for Switzerland and its watchmaking industry. Now it's exported everywhere, even to the Chinese emperor's court. But of course, once the wars were over, many Swiss craftsmen relocated and returned to the various courts of Europe to work on exceptional pieces. All the more so as the enthusiasm for the sciences in the 17th and 18th centuries facilitated progress in watchmaking. In 1638, in his discourse on the two new sciences, Galileo established the movements of the pendulum. Then in 1657, Christian Huygens created the first pendulum clock, and in 1675, the first watch with a spiral pendulum. A century later, in 1777, Swiss watchmaker Abraham Louis Perlet made the mechanical watch automatic. No longer needing to be wound every day, it wound itself. The watch rotor turns on itself, automatically winding the barrel spring. And in 1790, Jacques Edros, then terribly fashionable, created small wristwatches that could be worn like jewelry. Caroline Bonaparte, Napoleon's youngest sister, and the Queen Consort of Milan loved them. They say she wears a different one every day of the week. But the wristwatch remains a typically feminine accessory. Men, on the other hand, prefer the gusset watch, which is less discreet, bigger, and more masculine. I'm not going to comment, right? It's the times that wanted it that way. But the fact remains we've got our famous wristwatch, and it's only a matter of time before guys start wearing them too. Things don't change until the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. In 1880, for officers of the German Navy, the Swiss firm Girard Perigo mass-produced wristwatches. These military accessories are cutting-edge, sturdier, flatter. They even withstood a certain amount of water immersion, which had previously been impossible. In 1903, Frenchman Louis Cartier made the wristwatch truly popular, and it now adorns the wrists of sportsmen, airplane pilots, and even the general public. A new revolution was already underway as the idea of quartz clocks began to take shape. But this research would take 60 years to complete. Quartz is an inexpensive electronic component supplied with energy by a battery that enables the watch motor to oscillate continuously and very stably. On December 25, 1969, the Seiko Group launched the first quartz watch, the Astron 35SQ. It was the fruit of more than 10 years of intense research. It's only five seconds behind per month or one minute per year. This new formula is more precise than a mechanical watch and costs three times less. At the same time, Longines launches the first liquid crystal watches and Hamilton markets its first watch with electroluminescent LED display. The watch is now an accessory that's easy to offer to everyone. And you might say, it's over. Nothing's going to change. And yet, it hasn't. In 1983, Ernst Tomka and his team of engineers went to war against Asian competition. They created the Swatch, a contraction of the word Swiss and watch. Also quartz-powered, the Swatch's plastic components and bracelet offer a multitude of design possibilities, as well as low production costs. With the added bonus of extremely simplified assembly, it's a jackpot. Selling for the equivalent of $50, over a million were sold in the first year, and two and a half million in the second. We design bracelets and dials in constant collaboration with the artistic and fashion worlds. Watches are no longer necessarily the exceptional jewels handed down from generation to generation. It's more a fashion accessory that's part of the everyday look. Technological advances inspired engineers to associate the watch with the world of the internet and cell phones. This was the beginning of the smartwatch. In 1984, Pulsar and Seiko developed the first smartwatch that could be used to make appointments via a calendar, use a calculator, and even receive SMS messages from 1990. In 2004, Microsoft offers a watch with GPS, and in 2011, the first Android-connected watch via Bluetooth sees the light of day. 
In 2015, Tim Cook finalizes all these technological advances by democratizing the connected watch, his famous Apple Watch, which can check emails and messages, listen to music, take photos, and make calls while synchronizing its data with the owner's iPhone. It can be customized with 12 interchangeable straps in leather, steel, or fluoroelastomer. Apple has even signed a collaboration with Hermes to produce handcrafted leather straps. Of course, competing brands have adapted, and today there's something for everyone. In the end, it all depends on what you can afford, but also the occasion or the desire. The choice is yours. So, what do you prefer? Do you prefer a luxury watch or something more practical? An old and famous house, a trendy techno firm, or a typical French or European brand? Frankly, once again, there's something for everyone, and don't let the old-fashioned materials and traditional techniques fool you. They still appeal to a lot of people. In any case, the next time you look at the time on your watch, well, think about its history and how you have a compendium of technological advances right there on your wrist. It has taken millennia to delicately place a little bubble of time on your wrist. And I think that's pretty cool. Thanks to Mamzelle Lerev for working with me on this watch episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to give it your usual thumbs up, comment, share, and of course, subscribe. Whether it's to the Nota Bene channel, the second bonus channel, or the Nota Bene podcast. Because yes, we also exist as podcasts. See you soon.